around you, around your friends and family, there are 10 gases whose concentration affects your well-being and the well-being of those who love you. Many people are concerned about the food they eat. When you go to a supermarket, you check the label to understand how much protein or carbs are in those products. And maybe you top up with vitamin supplements at the end of the day. But do you spend the same amount of time being concerned about the air quality you breathe at home or work? Because I don't, and I really think I should. So here are 10 parameters whose concentration we should watch. Traditional measuring stations use up to seven different gas analyzers targeted to specific greenhouse gases. Currently, air quality monitoring stations are complex, bulky, immobile, and difficult to operate. And we need far more of them. We have good news for you. Those 10 gases can be monitored using a unique device, small, and potentially so low cost, you could have it integrated in your phone, in your car, your smart TV, or your air conditioner. Welcome to the mid-infrared revolution. The European Commission has already set air quality standards, and we know that sensors operating in the mid-infrared range are key to guarantee the compliance of those standards. So, on 22nd of September, the Mid-Infrared Alliance gets back together to address the key challenges in bringing their solutions to the air quality monitoring market. We want to showcase amazing new developments, like the ones of the company Miro, that using Mirayar Tech, they can monitor concentrations of 10 gases at the same time, and everything is combined into a single beautiful device. But there is a problem, and at Epic, we believe in coming straight to the point. The problem is the price. We need to produce mid-air sensors in much higher volume, thus reducing the unit price by orders of magnitude. The end users play an important role here, and who are those? Well, ultimately, it is you. But I'm thinking about the smart mega cities of the near future, where fighting against pollution is a priority. And talking about pollution control, space agencies play a huge role. NASA and ESA will be present in the room. I am a huge fan of ESA Sentinel programs. However, in Sentinel-5, they used wavelengths shorter than the mid-infrared. This is a huge opportunity for the future, as we have already proven that mid-air spectroscopy is more accurate and less sensitive to changes in humidity. And let me remind you that joining the Mid-Air Alliance is free of charge. It is a joint effort between EPIC and the European Commission. Join us, let's do Mid-Air business, and there will be plenty of opportunities in our online meeting on Wednesday, September 22nd. Let's take a deep breath at 3 p.m. And we all already took a deep breath and we are full of energies to start this meeting. My name is Jose Pozo. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of EPIC and together with Tracy Vanik, the Head of Market Research, we are here hosting this event, but also hosting on behalf of the Mid-Infrared Alliance, the joint effort the European Commission and EPIC to bring together all the key companies in Europe on Mid-Infrared. EPIC has been growing quite a lot during the pandemic times. We are now 749 members, but we still Still know each company individually. What's up with our task, our goal, and our passion? And speaking of behalf, I think of 13 people, half of them with a PhD. Our job is to know the technologies of our member, but also to organize key events, provide you with networking opportunities, to help you raise capital, giving you the biggest website in the world to find a job in photonics, jobsinphotonics.com. And also, thanks to Tracy Vanik, provide you with also market reports. Today is our chapter four of the Epic Online Technology Meeting Season 5. And today, as I said, we talk about meeting ferret technologies, but have a special attention to the meeting that 
is happening next week on Monday. Head up displays from 2D to augmented reality. That's going to be also a spectacular. And if you are in the quantum world, we also support the quantum industry. And on the 6th of October, we have our meeting on atomic clocks and network synchronization with some of the top companies in the world, from Orolia all the way to Ericsson. Do not miss that one either. But today, Today is about the Mid Infrared Alliance. Today is about talking about Mid Infrared Technologies. I can't be more excited about this. First of all, I would like to thank our media partner, Electro Optics. Thank you so much for helping us raise this momentum on Mid Infrared. But most important, this meeting will be possible without the supporter. Sponsors today, Art Photonics, all the way from Berlin. If you're looking for specialty fiber in the mid infrared, Art Photonics provides the, the right charcoal fiber for your needs. If you have a, a need for a semiconductor laser between the visible all the way to mid infrared, Nanoplast develop a laser for every specific wavelength, all the way from Würzburg, Germany. If you look, you need detectors in the mid infrared. The best mid infrared detectors in the world are made in Poland. They are made in Warsaw and they are made by Vigo System. If what you're looking is to enter the European Micro Optics Revolution. The company leading the European Micro Optics Revolution is SUS Micro Optics, providing wafer level manufacturing of micro optics for any application between automotive all the way to data on telecom. And finally, last but not least, all the way from beautiful, from beautiful Eblana Photonics, developing DFB lasers in Ireland for many years, already helping the companies having a specific wavelengths also in the mid infrared. And with with all these companies and many more, we have put together a fantastic agenda. We want is everyone here to understand your needs. So these companies are going to be the speakers today. We are going to start with NASA. We're going to have Miro Analytical, Air Nova, Nanoplast, CSEM. We want the, all of them to answer the epic question. What can you do for you and what can you do for them? And this is the supply chain. This slide, this beautiful slide, represents all the companies that register for the meeting today. If you are an Epic member and you missed your logo in this slide, that only means that you forgot to register and don't let it happen again. Notice that we have studied every company individually. You're looking, for example, vibrometers. You go to system integrator vibrometer and you have there Julite all the way from Pavia, Italy. If you're looking from, for a company developing micro optics, you go to the optics coding section in the micro optics, how all the companies in the group to develop micro optics. The purpose of this slide is to make sure that today, with the people in this room, you do business. So make sure you find the company you want to talk to and in the next two hours, do so because this is about that, about connecting companies. And this meeting, just to make people jealous, is also live stream in YouTube. Hello, YouTubers of the world. If you want to get in touch with any of the participants, just all you have to do is send me an email, jose.pozo at epic and I would love to make an introduction between you and the particular company you want to cooperate with. If you have a question during the meeting, of course, write in the chat, and I will read it in the room. And this is also valid for the people here with me in the Zoom room. This meeting is to connect, use the internal chat. We have an internal chat and talk to each other as much as possible. If you have questions and questions are very encouraged and very much needed, ask constantly. We really want you to connect. That was my introduction. It took eight minutes of your time. I hope it was worth it because now is when the meeting becomes spectacular. We go to the star. We go to every child's favorite company in the world. We go to the dream company I always wanted to work with. We go to NASA, and from NASA, we have in the room one quite very famous person, research fellow from NASA, Hyun Jung Kim. Thank you very much for joining the meeting today. The whole world, the whole epic universe is looking forward to interacting with you. Okay. Hyun Jung? Oh, yeah, can you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. Where are you? Where are you right now? Oh, I mean, I'm working in NASA through my company, National Institute of Aerospace. Then the NASA Langley Research Center is located in Hampton, Virginia, in United States. But physically, I'm in Alabama. I'm on a travel this week. So before I start my testing this morning, I joined this meeting and then I can see many uh, people, new people in all of the world. So, so you're, in if you are asking, yeah. you're in Alabama, it is 9 a.m. today, right? 
Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Good morning. Exactly. Let's have a nice cup of coffee. And uh, Hyun Jung, can you share with us the, the screen and we can see your slides? And remember, this meeting is for you to engage with the EPIC members. So people are going to ask you a lot of questions. Fantastic. You can open the PowerPoint. It's like Shamo, the floor, and the attention of everyone, I love saying this, the attention of everyone goes to NASA at an epic meeting. The floor is yours. Hyunjun, you are muted, so we need to unmute you. You are muted in Zoom, yes. And now, Yes, and now you can go back to the PowerPoint and start the NASA show. Yes, it's working well. You are not muted anymore. You can start your presentation. Yes, slideshow mode, and you are ready to rock. The floor is yours. I think we are having some problem for receiving the sound all the way from Virginia which is from Alabama, sorry. We are having some brand to receiving the Alabama sound. Sweet home, Alabama. Hyun Jung, Kim, we really cannot hear you. Uh, I think we are going to solve this. Do you think we, we know how to solve this right now? Let's try to open the Zoom window. Uh, I think we really have to ask you to... Can you speak for us, yeah. Hyun Jung? Yes, now we can hear you. Let's yes, try to share the I screen think. again. This is the beauty of making the show live. Some people actually pre-record the presentations. Who cares? It's better the live mm -hmm. entertainment. Okay. Yes. And now we share. Now. Oh, fantastic. Yes. The floor is yours. Can you, okay. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. I'm so happy. Okay. About that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I mean, thank you, everybody, for joining this talk, my talk in all over the world, I'm super excited and it's a big honor to give my speech today. Uh, uh, again, my name is Hyun Jung Kim and I'm working in National Institute of Aerospace and resident in NASA Langley Research Center. Here, there, I'm sure here um, are my team members, several team members in NASA Langley, which is uh, Mr. William Humphrey and then Dr. Matt Julian and my collaborator in University of Cambridge at uh, Dr. Kellan Williams and might be here. Hopefully, then if you are willing to share any uh, discussion later, please feel free to speak. Uh, again, my name is Hyun Jung Kim. Uh, I will give a presentation about mid-wave infrared filter beyond the uh, terrestrial, beyond the Earth. And then the big title is a P active. So uh, after my talk, I hope you understand the first, what is the P active? Because it's a quite new name. And second is what is the NASA application of mid-wave infrared range uh, uh, optics for our own application. And the very last is the future of the technology toward the space ap application beyond the uh, test area, again, beyond the Earth. That's what I hope after this uh, quick uh, overview of my research in NASA again. The mid-wave, as you, everybody already aware, the mid-wave infrared wave band contains a unique signature revealed uh, through spectral filtering. The, and it is very useful for uh, industry applications. Uh, not only the industry application and NASA, we are very much interested in this wavelength range because this wavelength range it can be used for, for the chemical and gas sensing, which is called LIDAR, science mission. And by understanding through that, uh, by measuring the water vapor or carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and then other uh, uh, chemicals, for we can make a, we could do, understand, deep understanding of cloud and responding to the warming climate for greenhouse gases. And this information and then accurate uh, information of the aerosol 
is a very important piece of the puzzle regarding the climate change. Now it's a climate change and greenhouse gases is very critical. So that is the one big, big reason we are working on the mid wave and the gas sensing. And second application is thermal imaging. It is uh, uh, we are willing to measure the water vapor and carbon dioxide, which is related to the rock and fallen emission. It is space launch vehicle. This is only two applications I addressed here, but there is more. And then the, not only now and for future NASA and space applications. Then now I will briefly mention because we have our own needs of mid-wave infrared optics, especially the filter for NASA and space application. Uh, my team is inside and outside the collaborator. What we developed the P-Active. P-Active means it's a phase change material-based actively tunable filter component. This is a very unique component. And then based on that uh, very interesting phase change material, phase change material is a well-known material and has been developed in 1960, then now it has been used for the cell phone and the memory of devices. The, for example, you can think about that the, uh, the material, it is uh, one of the base change material is the uh, candle wax. So it can be changing the solid candle and then liquid water tile is easier when you heat it up, liquid change it to the liquid state, and then just solidify, then it can be a crystal state. So that is the one of the example, but many other material is, they uh, change material is uh, change their sweet, uh, the amorphous and crystalline status very, very fast. It's nanosecond and then femtosecond and microsecond, which is in gigahertz and megahertz tuning speed. By incorporating that material in the well-known filter device design in fabric barrel uh, multi-layer design, you can make a filter which can tune the center wave length actively. So if you think about the between the thermal force and crystal structure, crystal structure, you can tune the center wave length, for example, two to five. Then we can when you continues to change the crystal image, partial crystallization through the partial crystallization, you can continue to tune the center wavelengths. For example, two, three, four, five, six. They depend on that the material and then the filter design, you can actively tune. So this, again, the most benefit of PFT, which is a phase change in material based the filter is very fast, ultra fast tuning speed, which is megahertz and gigahertz, and then also the state device, which is another benefit. And then through this, uh, by using this P active, we can increase the temporal and spectral resolution compared to the well-known filter wheel systems. So by, because we have our own need for using this tunable filter, so we develop this technology. And by using this technology, when you have a very compact, and then again, our solid state space, the compact, and then ultra fast switching speed, which can cover up the broad wave length range filter, its name is name is PFT, we can support uh, various NASA and space uh, missions. And now I just uh, highlight two different missions. One is, again, for the gas sensing is by using the four light application. And the other big mission is health monitoring of the space launch vehicle. This project is a uh, sci-fly. Its name is scientifically calibrated in-flight imaginary uh, project. The main goal of this project is collecting the calibrated temperature images of the space launch vehicle, of the, uh, especially in the uh, base heat region here, and uh, from induced flow separation during the ascent. Through this imaging, through the very accurate and then high quality imaging, what we expect 
is we can measure when we measure the very accurate and then uh, detailed the information of thermal imaging, we can reduce the uh, weight of the uh, the weight of that uh, heat shield is a thermal protection layer. That could now for the every uh, any kinds of space and the NASA mission is a swap. I will address the swap is a size, weight, power, add on the cost. The swap is the most important keyword. Then through by using the okay here by using that the uh, through the very accurate and precise thermal uh, measurement, we could reduce the weight of the of thermal protection system. That is the very big part of the swap, right? Size, we can reduce and then weight and then power. So that is the uh, most one big uh, application we are using, we are planning, we are using now, we are, we are planning to use for the space application by using the mid-wave infrared filter technology. And now we are, this is our status now and for future. After the P active, our next goal is iSpy, which is uh, integrated single optics spectroscopy imager here. Uh, when we, in our technology in this stage, we are pretty much low TRL, which means we just have our own technology and lab-based uh, demonstration and then build only filter fabrication. So now we are willing to find out the, our industry partner uh, to assemble our a filter uh, in the lens or camera kinds of integration involved the partnership and then after that through that uh, relationship and then co uh, collaboration we do we are willing to make uh, this kinds of integrated imager system uh, this imager system can increase the again spectral and temporal resolution for more accurate data collection for key measurement missions, such as uh, against sci fly mission, which is uh, such as a uh, rocket launch ascent imagery, imaging, and aerosol cloud cloud mapping, which is for for lidar application. So this is uh, just the imaging uh, we do. Uh, it's not the real imaging. Uh, this is what we expect through this. Uh, Big uh, I spy system. We are willing to use this I spy for the space launch system, imaginary processing, and then uh, lidar application. This is what we are doing now, and what we are willing to do from now. Then for space application beyond the Earth, beyond the uh, beyond the terrestrial. We send our uh, samples to the International Space Station, uh, International Space Station through the MISI program. MISI is the uh, Materials International Space Station Experimental Program, which is uh, started from NASA in here. And uh, again, the PFT with several uh, tunable filter, which is a cover of the mid-wave infrared range, which is two to five micrometer wavelength range tunable filter. Uh, we send that several filter to the ISS this uh, spring through the MISI 14 platform. Uh, we send that uh, we we selected the two different locations, which is Zenit and the wake direction. I will explain a little more soon. And then the purpose of this uh, program and then sending the sample to the space is uh, to determine the effect of the species and which is a filter uh, from the space environment. After the filters and then all the phase change material, we send the 42 samples to the space and then after the sample is returned to the Earth, we'll do the evaluation. But by now, every month, the program sends us the high-resolution program image, 
every month. By now, we got the three data, uh, June, July, and August. As you see here, this is some samples of the PXTV on, on space you know, through the MIS-14. This is a filter imaging again. As you see, it's like a, it looks like a no damage and still survive, which is super excited to me and then our team because it's our filter can be used for and can be used in space someday. This is another uh, uh, good example I'd like to share. And then uh, again, the, they also send us the environment to uh, flight data such as the temperature change and ultraviolet UV radiation change every month or every day basis. Then eventually they'll send us all the data after the uh, six months the exposure of the sample in the space. And again, we send the two sam uh, the uh, 21 sample to GNS direction and 24, 21 sample in wake direction, which is totally identical samples. It's a wake is away facing away from the direction of the uh, International Space Station travel. So no atomic oxygen uh, effect and moderated solar exposure, which is good for the lunar surface demonstration because the lunar surface doesn't have an atomic oxygen effect. And then another half of the same percent to the genus direction is facing away from the Earth. It's grazing atomic, it is a very good exposure on atomic oxygen and high solar exposure, which is good for the low Earth orbit demonstration. So based on this information, because of this reason, we send uh, half of the sample to wake and half of the sample to the genus side directions. Again, atomic oxygen is pretty much important because this is optics devices, optical filter. So optical, uh, atomic oxygen can be damage it and make a hazy and then change the uh, optical property of the filter itself. So after this uh, sample return to the Earth, we'll do the uh, all the analysis as we does before we send to the space. There will be open up the many other opportunity, not only for the NASA and space, but also for the industry application as well. Here is my team. I would like to emphasize again, this page change material is unique, but it has been started quite a long time ago, on 1966. And then our team and NASA started this uh, exciting PFTV research from 2016. And then here is, we have uh, I, uh, I spy research team with their NASA. And then MIT, we have a good collaboration. And then also Bujara and Hamilton. And then uh, we have a mission support team and NASA Langley for the LIDAR and for the space launch vehicle thermal monitoring. And I really appreciate all our team. And then we also have a, a good collaborator in University of Cambridge, the Dr. Kellan for Williams. Well, he's using this PFT for his own application for biomedical. And we, through the MISI, we have another good collaborator is MIT and University of Cambridge. So I'd like to emphasize this is, I'm giving a talk here, but this is our, our team's effort. And after this talk, what I really expect is like a, as I mentioned uh, when I start my talk, is uh, you might I hope you understand uh, what is, a little bit of understanding of the, what is a PFT. Why? What is a NASA application by using this mid-wave infrared filter? And what is the future of the technology toward the space application? So here, what I really hope we have some kinds of understanding and collaboration, potential collaboration on the PFTV itself, and then relate to the iSpy. Any company is inter interested in our technology and make a component level integration uh, idea. There will be a great opportunity we can discuss and collaborate. And if anyone is interested in the space, uh, application, then our data later, uh, the later analyzed data through the MISI, uh, we are 
we are very much welcome to discuss the, about that opportunity. All the way from Sweet Home Alabama, Hyun Jung Kim. Thank you so much for this great presentation. I have a lot of questions in the room for you and about the integrated single optic spectroscopic imager, I spy. I will not ask you about why choosing that name for something that you put on a satellite. I will not ask you that, but I have so many things to ask you, but I want the EPIC members to be the first ones to ask. So I'm going to go all the way to Poland. I'm going to go to Warsaw. Uh, and welcome to the meeting, the company Vigo. Vigo is one of the market leaders in developing mid infrared, mid infrared cameras and sensors. And Jerzy Mijas is with us. Jerzy, Chesh, I think you have some question for our speaker from NASA today. Ah, yes. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. And my question was, uh, what do you plan for your future, which you, which you described, which you presented? Do you, do you plan for, for a more wide use outside the space industry? I mean, uh, do, you, do you plan to, to commercialize this technology or do you see only, only applications in, uh, in basic research? Uh, I mean, we open up every opportunity, honestly. Here we have uh, two several invention disclosure and then it is on the process and patent. If you are in those in the industry partner is in those interested in that opportunity, that's good. Then we are, as I addressed it here, is we are willing to go to the next level. It's not only the technology. We want to expand this technology for system. And then because we are, we are doing research, I mean the research uh, center, but our technology have a very specific goal. It is used for the specific mission. So we cannot just stick on that the technology side. So we need to develop, we need to expand this technology for high level. It's component with the industry partnership, which we cannot do in here. Then assemble and then integrate our system for real, real NASA application. So we are pretty much cover up the entire procedure. Cheshi, I was told that you have one slide to show Hyun Jung and the rest of the room about the room for cooperation with Vigo in the Mini Fred Alliance. Now is a good time to show it. Yes, sure. Um, I, I, I hope that you can see this. So um, the topic today is environmental monitoring. Uh, we have been told about the atmosphere composition determination, the aerosols in the atmosphere, our our detectors, our detection modules can do that, can do much more, um, starting from the simplest NDIR uh, sensors up to very refined FTIR. Um, our detectors are used in all of these. Right now we have ROSE compliant detectors, which is also in line in, uh, in environmental mo uh, monitoring. And what you can do for us is is to tell us, to give us new ideas. What, what, what else can we detect? What else? Uh, mm. Can the medium infrared be used for? Uh, there is there is quite a lot, and we are ready for all of this. We we, are, we already have a a broad portfolio, but uh, if you if you think of anything that can be detected in the medium infrared, we are here to help you with this. Thank you. Thank you, Yeshi. And um, we have more questions for you, Hyun John. The second one is coming all the way. We're from Poland to Oslo. We go to Norway to welcome to the meeting Dirk Meyer from the company Ideas. Dirk, subassembly of detectors in the mid infrared is your master. What is your question? Yes, I just wanted to know whether uh, you can detect a concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere what could be detection limits and what concentrations can you distinguish and also maybe spatially resolve? Uh, that's a really great question. So I'm sorry, but unfortunately this moment I have no any uh, real data for the carbon dioxide uh, detection. We did some demonstration with the carbon dioxide flowing is matching the center wavelength in the lab, but we did not control the amount of the carbon dioxide. But based on our uh, fourth design of our PFT, our uh, uh, after wave HM, the Q factor is around the 70 nanometer 
rangey, but by tuning, uh, by designing and then simulation, we can make it more narrow. But best our resolution is pretty much a few nanometer. It's very challenging to go down to picometer, a picometer range because that's what NASA want. But it's very truly is I could say it's very challenging to us to make a very narrow bandwidth that uh, filter. Uh, best my answer is like, uh, uh, yeah, we could not measure the concentration change yet. So we okay. just do the demonstration of the, the carbon dioxide detection. Yes, to understand. So your system is based on the fabri Perot principle, right? Yes. Yes. So you could scan through many wavelengths sequentially, and you said you can scan very fast through. Yes. Okay, good. Then I understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. We, Thank are, you we are very excited about this. There is a company in the room that is setting up the thing of quantum cascade laser manufacturing in Europe, all the way from France, all the way from Grenoble, MirSense QCL lasers. Adrien, bon, bonjour. Uh, I guess bonjour. you have a good question from Hyun Jung, and I think there is a lot of room for cooperation here. Yes, uh, thanks, Hyun uh, Jung. I'm, I noted that in your slides, um, you, you mentioned uh, the fact that molecules absorb uh, light that's some in uh, the mid infrared spectrum and maybe you might want to know that uh, um, our company can offer you lasers up to 15 16 17 microns of wavelength and mm -hmm. um, for example at 15 microns we have customers that uh, measure benzene xylene toluene so maybe this could be of interest for you if you if you're trying to measure like aerosols or this kind of molecules so i just wanted to to let you know that um, you can acquire, yeah, 15, 16, 17 microns and higher wavelength uh, QCL lasers from our company, if you need. That's very good. Thank you, thank you, Andrea. And it's mostly it's in on our application, not only for this application, for future. Uh, I wonder if you, what is the laser size? Again, because in our application, now we are using the laser-based uh, LiDAR in airborne. Because airplane, so it has a pretty large room to fit the laser. But our next goal is space satellite based. In that case, the laser size is a big issue, so it should be very small. So I yes. hope you, yeah. your company have some option for the smaller size laser packaging. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we would uh, definitely need to discuss with you more in details, but. Just to let you know, uh, we have uh, customers in defense that use our lasers on board helicopters. And so we are used to really reduce the swap. And uh, we are very sensitive. Uh, uh, Adrian, Adrian, no, this is an epic meeting. I cannot tolerate sure. that answer. Can you sure. give us at least an estimation? What would be the size, including the payload size of the, of the laser system that you can provide for a 16 micrometer wavelength, more or less? Well, if you're just talking about the laser, you know, it's uh, this, uh, it's this. Thank this you. Gift. And uh, so very <laughs> Hyun Jung, you are on the safe side when you talk to companies like Mirsense or Nanoplast. The lasers are, are extremely small. Uh, I would like to go now from, from uh, Grenoble all the way to Canada, actually very close to where you are, Hyun Jung. I want to go to the company Iridium because they want setting up the thing on filters in the mid infrared. Jason, mm -hmm. you know how much I like you. Thank you for the private email that we, uh, discussion that we had in the in the back. What's on your mind? Uh, yeah, very interesting. Uh, uh, Hyun, uh, we, we make optical filters uh, in more standard method, not the phase controlled optical filter. So I was wondering how the spectral performance uh, bandwidth, I think you mentioned, is 60, 70 nanometers wide. But how, how broad blocking do you achieve with this? And how much tunability uh, can you get with these filters? Uh as again, we made a suit two different design. Is one is a well known fabric barrel multi layer design, and then we brought up the another design, the plasmonic nano hole design, which is a plasmonic based technology. So, this is again, this is only fourth version of the filter. This is not the another, yeah, we have many other rooms based on that, based on that two design. 
we tune we have a capability can cover up the two to five micrometer wavelengths range then both show the 70 nanometer yeah the uh bandwidth and then about 75 to 85 80 percent to transmittance then uh, again this is only for this first version then based on the phase change material there is variety of selection and the filter design you might have a better idea or directory or the fabric parrot and then any other design they can be cover up the more broad wave range range and then then cover up the in, uh, invisible wave range range as well so is it basically a, a, a standard, you know, typical Fabri-Pro uh, filter construction where you just have this one layer in it that's going to adjust the center wavelength of the uh, through that exactly. one? Exactly. We, yeah. uh, we put the uh, multi-layer. It's a silicon germanium. I can send you the, who say I will send you after the meeting, I will send you the paper, then Absolutely. can share with the people. So here is a, yeah, uh, are you, Iridian, Iridian. I, hopefully, I call your name yes, correctly. You. The Iridian. Then, what is that? Is like, a, yeah, we do use the silicone and germanium and multi layer as fabric pair of dirt. And then we add on the one, the phase change material in the middle that is the activate that the center wavelength only. So, but as on add on more layer, we can reduce the, yeah, the bandwidth. And then less layer, exactly the same way. But yeah, yes, you're right. Only one layer, phase change material in the middle that activate the center wavelength range. Interesting. Thank you. We go Thank from you. we go from Canada. Hyun uh, Jun just noticed this meeting is international. Okay? We go from Canada to Belgium. <laughs> we go to the company Caleste that make customized CMOS sensors. Jan Vermeeren, I oh. think you like this presentation very much. Hyun Jun is he wants to hear from you. Uh, okay, good. Uh, I had a question. In fact, uh, when I look to your filter setup, what is the out of band stopping power of your filters? Uh, that's the first part of the question. Second part, can you go further than an octave in bandwidth? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, uh, I'm sorry. I missed your fourth and third question because I'm trying to catch your face. So I'm sorry. Could you bring <laughs> or Jose, I'm could you, could you, <laughs> Jose, could you in summarize that question for me? Okay, good. Uh, first question was, uh, if you want to do accurate, uh, say, absorption measurements, uh, it's very important to see what is a parasitic out-of-band transmission, because it determines how much yeah, parasitic signal you have. Second question is, uh, yeah. Let's go for the can, first one first. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay yeah. no problem. So he's wondering about the out-of-band yeah, parasitic out of band, transmission. Yeah. Yes, that's a very good question as well. So thank you for bringing up that. Yes, for the LiDAR application, that is the exactly same question my uh, NASA collaborator brought up last week, our own meeting. <laughs> so that is a very important question for, but what we find that uh, that is another reason we use the Prosmonic Nano Array other design, not only in the fabric pair. By using that design, we have a very, I'm sorry, I'm, it's not a scientific uh, word, but we have, a, uh, we got less than one, below 1%, one hopefully I delivered the correct information. We got very, very low out of band uh, information. So that's the reason still we are on the optimization for the best application because this is, this filter is their objective is very interesting, but one filter cannot cover up the all application. So based on the LiDAR application, out of band is very important for the thermal imaging, best tuning and narrow band test is important. So based on the application, we are optimizing the design now. Then if I answer for your question is out of band, we are pretty good on the out of band refraction with the PNA design. As uh, we claim is zero uh, percent, but there is no zero percent at all. So in mm. the world, so we okay. think below one percent. And the second question: Can your filter go beyond one octave? Yeah. 
So quite often optical filters, and certainly if you go to meet the materials, etc., uh, are limited to uh, one octave, so a factor of two in, in uh, let's say, wavelength. Uh, what's with your filters? Uh, our filter is, it, it, uh, that is a very dependent on the material. So phase change material is a carcogenide, I'm saying it's a carcogenide based phase change material, which is germanium antimaterialide, and then you can do the doping and then change it antimony to the serenide. Is there is many combination there. GSD itself is a transparent uh, from two to 10 micrometer wavelength range. And then GSSD, germanium antimon serenide, Teroide that is a transparent from the 800 nanometer up to 50 micrometer wavelength range, and antimony teroide, antimony teroide SBT is a transparent from 600 nanometer up to 50, 50 micrometer wavelength range. So by selecting the one of the material, you can uh, you can change your uh, wavelengths of the filter. So by using the filter, what I used can go up to 10 micrometer wavelength range. Hyun Jung, uh, for me, it's spectacular that you are here. We could make an entire meeting asking you questions. I would like to ask you about, <laughs> about the, the, the different optics that you need, because you were talking in the beginning of your presentation, you actually said that for the longer wavelengths, for most of the application, you needed ultra large optics uh, and, and i wrote that because i found that quite uh, quite exciting i would like to show you your slide again yourself and ask you to further comment there and also if you see any particular challenge or room for cooperation it was in the beginning of your presentation you see here you were talking about the fast switching plus wide spectral range and large diameter optics for the wavelength between three to seven microns could you comment on that and is there some room for cooperation there uh, you mean that the wide spectral range cover up? The large diameter uh, optics. Uh, large diameter optics. I mean, that's what I'm willing to say is like, uh, uh, we are, this filter, I'm sorry, I think that is uh, some typo or is a small diameter optics. This, this is the small diameter optics is all solid state devices. Thank you for pointing out that. That's great. You are, you are awesome. <laughs> I, 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 there's many companies I want you to, to meet, to, to be introduced. For me, it's very important. For example, there's a company in Spain, which is called ACE Optics. Andres Stifuentes, the CEO of ACE Optics, is here with us. Whenever you need a partner to design the instrument for a space, uh, it's interesting that you get in touch with them. Andres, are you with us? Yeah. You saw, you saw the presentation from NASA. You saw that there is some, perhaps some room for cooperation. I was very excited when I see the instrument I spy. And when I saw the instrument I spy, you see here the, the slide, I saw that for them was very important the right positioning of the optics on the top of the detector. Uh, is there uh, any challenges that you could help them with when it comes to the alignment and the robustness of the design, taking into account that they want to put this in yeah. the harshest environment there is? Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Jose, for your always such a great uh, introduction. Mm. <laughs> Much appreciated and thank you, Hyunyun. I think it was an excellent uh, presentation. I definitely learned a lot. Um, yeah, I think for, for positioning lenses, it looks like a, a simple system, like almost like a like a, a board lens. But the, the the issue in space mounted optics really is um, um, the variations in from from how you mount it on Earth and then mm -hmm. what what happens when you send it into space. And 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 that could really uh, uh, ruin your your uh, the, the the focalization point of your optics, introduce aberrations, and and even for a filtering kind of a spectral analysis, it could ruin the resolution, and you might not get the spectral resolution that, that you might need if that were the the case that you were uh, doing. So I'm, I think NASA engineers probably have solved many of these problems uh, many times. Um, but definitely something that uh, here at ASC we, we work on a lot is on optical mechanics. The optics themselves, that's our core, is designing optical systems for for many applications. And particularly in harsh environments, we do have quite a bit of experience. We've, we've um, 
design and build some optics that will be in uh, in the ether programs or a harsher environment than in the like uh, in near the plasma of a fusion reaction is pretty harsh. But but space has some very particular challenges: vacuum, changes in temperature, the variation as it has to be mounted on Earth and then sent to space, or the weight constraints, as you mentioned very well, the swap analysis, and and then how the lenses themselves are held together. So all those things are, are things that uh, ASC could, uh, could could definitely uh, you know give, give you some give some thoughts on if that were ever a necessity. Thank you, Jose. Hyun Jung, welcome to Epic. You have been <laughs> spectacular. Thank you for answering all these questions. This is what we normally do, so I hope we didn't overwhelm you. But also be prepared to the second part. I'm going to formulate a lot of introductions because people are asking me to get in touch with you to discuss further how to help you with that filter. That was truly spectacular. As spectacular as this meeting is bringing together many companies. For example, you should know that in the room, in the room I have Pavel Klusinski from Poland, which is the CEO of the company Aeroptic which is one of the key companies in the segment doing real-time gas analysis. And as an epic event, he came here looking for partnerships. I will mm -hmm. go to Pavel later. So, oh, no, Pavel is here with us. Pavel, Chesh. Yes. Oh. Aeroptic, what brings you to this meeting? What kind of cooperations can we start with epic members? Well, of course, first of all, I mean, we are constantly looking for the new uh, sources, of the new sources and new detectors in infrared uh, Mid infrared region because we are you know using these uh, photonics devices for for detection of, of, of gases in different uh, industrial processes. So that's a, that's basically for process control and uh, as, as well as emission monitoring. So basically, we're always uh, looking for something uh, which could enable us to measure even more components with one device. And that's uh, always uh, you know the key questions from us: Can we get the multi-spectral? widely tunable source with a very narrow band emission, because that's very crucial for selective measurement. Pavel, you're looking for light sources and detectors. Stay with us. I think I made the perfect introduction to our next speaker. We go all the way for Würzburg. We go to Nanoplast. I couldn't have made a better introduction, right? The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the provider of any laser at any wavelength. The floor is yours. OK, thank you, Jose. Thank you for this. As always, perfect and kind introduction. And um, always thank you for bringing the spirit to the ER uh, community. And a special thank you for uh, EPIC bringing all these partners together, all these photonic partners here in Europe, especially together in, on one table in, in meetings and, and uh, working together. So, but now I have to stop the praising because I only have six minutes. I learned. You can see we are also part of the Meet IR Alliance, and I just can give you the call. Enter this alliance, work with us together to make a scale up of mid infrared technology to bring it to new markets, new applications. I am absolutely convinced at the moment we are just scratching the surface of possible applications. Jose, you managed, uh, you mentioned already uh, the telephones and and uh, portable devices. I am absolutely convinced that there is a big future for me there are uh, devices in these areas and we can solve many, many problems uh, we have nowadays in mankind. And, and uh, yeah, I think we can contribute quite a lot. So as you can see on my first slide, I'm the CEO of NanoPlus, but I'm also, also the CEO of Sensor Light Technologies. And uh, this is pointing a little bit in the direction of mass production. NanoPlus is a provider of um, I would say semiconductor based light emitters uh, all over different wavelengths ranges, more for industry application for applications up to uh, 100,000 pieces perhaps. And then the light is aiming on bringing these devices into big markets, into markets like automotive, uh, healthcare, portable devices and so on. And this is the topic of sensor light. But so from, from, the, from the basis, it's, it's, it's very similar to each other. Okay, so let's start uh, with devices we can produce at um, NanoPlus. One key part, uh, one key element of NanoPlus, which is very important, is that we have the full vertical integration of the whole value chain to manufacture optoelectronic devices. And this is important because this allows us to react very flexible on customer needs and, and uh, yeah, make new devices, developing new technologies, 
and uh, we are in the end bring the best solution to our customer. We have everything starting from material design. We can do the every taxi in house. We have device processing in house. We have all the quality control like SEMs and and other measurement technologies like FTR and so on in house. We do all the device monitoring in house, mounting in house, and have all testing and burn in here uh, at our site. This is very important because with this full integration of the whole manufacturing process, we are really, really fast, flexible, and can do deviations of our standard product. So whenever you find something which is a device which nearly is perfect for your application, but a little bit is missing, just let us know because we can uh, develop it further. We can introduce new uh, specifications, new capabilities into the device, and, and then perhaps it's better suited for your applications. In principle, we have uh, five pillars of product at the moment. So the first one are DFB lasers, then we have Frappe Poirot lasers, SLDs, mid infrared LEDs, and technology development. The technology development is for customers, uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, developing new devices, uh, bringing new, uh, new capabilities to our existing devices, and adapting our portfolio to your needs. This is uh, the important part. Let's start off with the DFB lasers. We can cover with diet lasers, lasers range from 760 nanometers up to 2.9 micron, 3 micron, more or less. And you can have, in, at any point in this wavelength range, you can have a laser from us. Then we have the interband cascade laser and covering 2.8 up to 6.5 micron. And we are crawling upwards in wavelengths, I think seven micron we already have in the lab and going on into this direction. So um, when you need longer wavelengths and these lasers behave more or less like diode lasers. They have fantastic low thresholds. They have really good performance. They have decent amount of output power. So if you want to measure, for, for example, organic com compositions, then you can use a very nice ICL for this. And furthermore, there's the quantum cascade lasers ranging from 6 to 14 micron. So whenever you have any need for long wavelength devices for glucose monitoring or whatever, we can provide a laser uh, in the long wavelength range. Our lasers have typically a large tuning coefficient because we're optimizing for applications like gas sensing or biological uh, species sensing. They have high power and we have a lot of variation of, for packages. So you, uh, Hyung Yu, our smallest package is um, perhaps only a millimeter uh, in size. So you can have very, very lightweight and small packages. On the Mars rover, on, 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 on the Mars uh, Curiosity rover, our laser is a little bit bigger. It's, it's um, more or less like the laser you see on the right side, the TO5 package. Um, and and uh, so it's a little bigger, but it's, it's perfectly suited for the application in the Mars rover. Well, we can provide packages with TC and NTC that you can measure the temperature of the laser and adjust perfectly to your wavelength range in your application. Here are some examples for applications in environment and also a little bit uh, to the side of uh, environmental measurements, medical measurements in this case. Uh, so you can measure methane, for example, and you see one application in a bike, you can drive around and make measurements of methane li uh, uh, leakage. You have one example of an automotive measurement measure measuring the exhaust from cars. And I could not resist to put in Volkswagen there. And uh, we offer, also have a lot of industry applications like SO2 monitoring, what comes out of my chimney? The question behind this is very important. And we, we provide also needed wavelengths for these kind of applications. And uh, if you have a special background composition, for example, we can adjust the wavelengths to a wavelength that you can avoid to conflict this background composition of your special use case. So we are very flexible, and with this, you are very flexible in your applications. Here's one example, hydrocarbons, uh, methane, uh, acen, propane, butane, uh, and all the others. Uh, you can measure in the three point something uh, range and, and we can have, uh, we, can, we can give you lasers for this. Very well suited for measuring these kind of gases. Um, next, our Fabric Pro laser diet. So if you need more power, again, we have diet lasers, interband cascade lasers, quantum cascade lasers, but if you need more power up to one watt, we can provide lasers for this. Uh, you can, for example, think about illumination and later measure, measure with one filter uh, special compositions of, of uh, gases, for example, or if you want to measure um, uh, uh, biological liquids, for example, you need more power 
um, but not the spectral uh, uh, limit of, of uh, or the spectral width of uh, DFB lasers. And we can provide the laser for this. We can deliver the high powers you need uh, for, for this kind of applications. Also, we have SLDs. Um, they have a little broader spectrum than a, a DFP. You see the picture in the right. It's a little, broad, little more broad spectrum for um, liquid sensing, for example, and uh, more low cost kind of applications where don't, you don't need a very specific um, um, uh, uh, wavelengths like a DFP hazard. And again, we have all these different various packages. You can have with TC, without TC, with NTC, and all the uh, variations of this. And we have now mid infrared LEDs for portable devices when it has to become very small, or for point detectors. You know, when you want to measure the ambient of your room, for example, then uh, mid infrared LED is perhaps the uh, choice of wavelengths. Of, of device uh, for, for this kind of applications. We have high output power, two milliwatt, now at what, uh, several wavelengths uh, up to 10 milliwatts. If you go to longer wavelengths, 6.5 uh, uh, microns, for example, perhaps it's only one milliwatt, but we are working on this and, and, and uh, the output power is increasing all the time. We have, again, various packages and we can adapt it to your needs, uh, the packages. And I think this is a very exciting um, new device for high volume uh, applications and for point detectors you know, and, and these kind of applications. Yes, yeah, this uh, were my six minutes in my talk. If you have any questions, please let me know and, and I'm open for your questions. Oh, we have a lot of questions. Lars, thank you so much for the great presentation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I already announced this in the chat during the presentation when it comes to the semiconductor laser diodes. We are actually developing quite a lot of micro optics in Europe for the packaging of those. When you are talking about larger wavelengths, wavelengths in the mid infrared, to what extent is, uh, is a challenge to find those micro optics? Actually, those micro optics sometimes filters in the mid infrared applied to them. Yeah, it becomes more and more difficult if you go to longer wavelengths, definitely. So you have uh, to fight absorption, you have to fight um, yeah, good optical quality lenses, and you have, you have to search for this. So yes, there is a need, and I think if we can get new contact there, we are definitely interested in fibers, in lenses, in, in uh, filters sometimes, in beam splitters. Um, this is always uh, something of interest for us and for our customers. Jason, in a, in a separate discussion uh, last week, we talked about glucose sensing. We talked about the need for, for filters in that particular wavelength range. And today we are talking about environmental monitoring. I have here Nanoplast who develops fantastic semiconductor lasers. It's a challenge to find these filters. Uh, I know Iridian rarely develops filters for other people's optics, but developing the whole micro optic could be something that you could help here, correct? Well, we, we yeah, re really, it's the it's the filtering aspect are itself. So you know, if, if there's a, a system that needs that wavelength selective element in it, uh, then then that standalone filter is is where we come in. And the midwave IR, we're very comfortable in. We talked about as you mentioned, uh, glucose detection, but also things like a lot of work with folks doing photoacoustic spectroscopy or non-dispersive infrared uh, spectroscopy for gas sensing and gas detection in the midwave infrared and right up into the long wave infrared as well. Occasionally, coding maybe on customer supplied optics, but that's that's an extra level of complexity that we usually try to avoid. So usually the standalone filters themselves, Jose. Uh, I also would like to go to Sweden because we have a, from Spectrogon, we have a Stefan Anderson today with us. Stefan, uh, obviously you also develop uh, optical filters in the mid infrared. When it comes to make this micro optics for the packaging of semiconductor diodes, is there any expertise experience that you could share with Nanoplast, perhaps in a collaboration? Uh, uh, start to thank you for a very interesting talk. We're interested in, in this. Uh, what Spectrogon do, we do uh, optical components for, for detectors. Normally uh, larger or larger size uh, than, you are, than you are talking about, larger size filters. But we do also coat directly on detectors, which could be interesting maybe for you. 
I, yeah. I'll make the introduction in the past. I always like to connect both sides of the supply yeah. chain. So I would like to go back to Pavel. Pavel from iDoptic, thank you very much once again for joining the meeting today. As a system integrator, as a company, you were you said in the beginning in the introduction to NanoPlus presentation that you are looking for certain laser sources for your system. Could you comment a bit on perhaps the, the aspect ratio or even the volume uh, for which you are interested in those laser diodes for how, how many units you need and for what particular applications? Well, so today, I mean, the, basically the gas sensing for industrial applications is still, uh, you know, not very high volume uh, products. We are talking, you know, maybe, you know, a couple of hundreds to up to 1,000, you know, 2,000 per year. That's that's the kind of still the, the situation as it was in the past. Yeah? It's growing, but uh, it's not a high volume application. It's, it's, it's rather hundreds than the 20,000 and so on. And when it comes to the to the aspect ratio, uh, I, I don't want to ask you directly about price, but if you want to comment on that, is there is there a challenge when it comes to size or when it comes to price of those units? This meeting is a meeting in which you want to talk the way it is, so don't be afraid. Just tell us, is it too expensive technology today? Well, I mean, that's the, basically the point. So, so it has to be much cheaper in order to be able to be applied for the much lower and much <coughs> much lower cost instruments that means higher volumes. So it has to go down, you know, by the order of magnitude. So that's uh, that's in principle you need to have a source of you know at least you know 100 euro price tag in order to be able to reach you know, for example, uh, application where you can control the, the, the air conditioning systems and so on. Because the technology is very suitable for these applications, but I mean the price is uh, it's still the the price of the, the photonics uh, components is, is too expensive. Johannes, tell us. Yes, yes, I, I, I know this discussion uh, for sure. So in principle, the price of our semiconductor lasers is very cheap if you go to high volume. Um, the issue normally arises that we have, uh, or that the technology is not mature enough in some senses to address these markets. We have now first customers going into uh, applications with 50,000, 80,000, 100,000 devices. This is under development and I think time will, will uh, show that this is possible. From principle, it's, it's, it's all a law of scale. If you scale up the volume, the price will come down. It, it's, it's very natural. Um, but you really have to address these kind of applications. Industry monitoring is not an application which will go into the 100,000 pieces, it's quite sure. As, as Pavel also said, uh, ambient monitoring of, of, of your room is something, but it, this goes into the millions already. Um, we are ready for this. We have sensor light in our, in our back for, for doing the scale up, for delivering lasers in uh, high, high volume, millions of lasers for low price. We are ready. Our first target is automotive. Uh, okay, not the easiest market, but we have lasers for this. And so, yeah, we are ready to go. Just come around, give me your application, and you will get the The yeah, application is there. The challenge is there. And iDoptic is very well connected to some of the biggest process companies in Europe. So here there is a clear connection. Johannes, mm -hmm. wait, because I'm going to ask Pavel a question, but I'm coming back to you. Mm -hmm. But uh, Pavel, uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you also said about the need for laser diodes, but also the need for detectors and cameras. Uh, is there any particular challenge that you have for the the camera manufacturers in industrial process monitoring? Well, so basically I, uh, what we today use is, the, is mainly only you know, one the detectors, you know, one pixel detectors, and that's uh, no, not, uh, not so much cameras at, at the moment, but I mean, it could of course be a, also a good advantage to use cameras. But in, in a way, you know, the same question here, you know, we need the detectors which have a very bro uh, broadband coverage. Because what we are doing today is that uh, we already have a technology to combine discrete uh, laser sources into our device, and then uh, we also already cover quite a large ba uh, bandwidth. You know, it's almost you know four thousand nanometers, which means we also ideally would have a very broadband detector. And that's uh, so we also have some solutions which we kind of you know have to work out uh, internally. But uh, but again, broadband detectors. And also reaching out to the you know mid infrared region. 
being from Poland and sure you know the success story Vigo mostly you also know the success story Ayer Nova in Sweden do you know one European boom in MWIR that is from Spain is NIT new infrared technologies Rodrigo Linares you just heard the challenge from Pavel they are going one pixel they want a business case to go to more than one pixel but they need large wavelength range how do you answer to that well, uh, <clears throat> I've known Pavel for a, for a long time. He knows the, the, the sensors that we, uh, that we produce. I would say that we have an advantage, um, a competitive advantage compared to other technologies, and is that we can manufacture the infrared sensors in silicon wafers, uh, meaning that we can produce in volumes and at the end obtain very affordable uh, detectors. Uh, they have uh, these detectors that we produce they have a uh, broadband detection uh, the peak detection is in 3.7 microns but they have detection from one to five uh, microns and i would say that what really differentiates us is the capability to build the imaging sensors the cameras um, that uh, can be used also for uh, environmental uh, monitoring like uh, we are treating in this uh, meeting there are several examples uh, in recent examples where the cameras have been used for this uh, purpose. Uh, Logan Ballet here is uh, from CSM is in the is in the meeting and we've participated with uh, CSM in the FLARE project in an H20 project where uh, the camera was integrated integrated into a spectrometer to detect uh, CO, CO2 and other gases. Um, actually there was a really nice uh, test uh, with a helicopter uh, yeah. in the harbor of Copenhagen. And yes, also several activities related with dual convex spectroscopy uh, to build hyperspectral cubes uh, detecting um, uh, gases uh, using the, the camera at several uh, thousand, uh, several kilohertz uh, frame rate. So I think we have a, a, a nice product that fits uh, a nice sensing technology that fits within the, the requirements of the industry. Affordable, so are, uh, high speed, uh, uh, imaging. Uh, uh, I would like to congratulate you there because of what you have done in the Enguir sector on the last on the last decade and how fast you have positioned NIT as a leader in Enguir cameras is out of this world. Uh, I would like to welcome to the meeting a success story of Europe as well, Miro Analytical, Oleg Asef. I think you have many questions for people in the room. What's on your mind? So I, a question to Johannes. Thank you for the great summary of your product. So you mentioned the price issue. This is definitely what we should discuss. But the second question to you is the, actually the reproducibility. If someone orders hundreds of same lasers, can you guarantee same parameters like driving car and temperature and output power and tunability and so on? Uh, yes, we, in the last 22 years, we made a lot of progress into this direction to ensure that the windows of the parameters become smaller and smaller. Um, so nowadays our lasers are more or less all the same uh, when, when they leave us. But you have to define the same right. a little bit more. <laughs> but uh, for, I, I think they are, they are good enough for, for, for these kind of applications. You don't have double uh, threshold or something like this. It's, it's, it's all in, in a... Uh, and would you say that it's still improving? I'm sorry. It's going to be better. Is it still improving? Is this window narrowing down? Um, it's it's, no, I think we are quite there. We, I, I don't see any issues anymore with, with variation over our production. Uh, but yes, sure, it's improving because the volumes are going up. And this is a key driver for getting the same uh, lasers over and over again. If you ask a wavelength, which is very rarely asked, then perhaps we have a bigger variation uh, in, in the first lasers, but uh, we are tightening all our designs. We are uh, improving our, our process and um, unifying our process all over with the different steps and different material systems. And this is unification, which goes on in 10 years now at NanoPlus. We, we more and more narrow the windows down of, of the specifications. Johannes, you're going to hear a lot more from Oleg in a bit because he's going to give a feature presentation. But before that, before. Pavel from Aeroptic, if you're looking for something spectacular on the mid infrared cameras and detectors, let us go to Sweden and meet my very good friend Eric Kostar from Ayernova. I really get excited about this presentation on the floor and the attention of everyone goes to you, Eric.
Okay, thank you. I will share my try to share my screen. So hello everyone. I start to know uh, quite many people in the in this uh, in this network. That uh, that's fine. Also, that's nice. Uh, so, do you see the? Yeah, you see my screen. Uh, yes, okay? crystal clear. So today, uh, so I've been asked to, uh, to uh, ask. Uh, I propose to, to present uh, Ayanova's uh, detector, and uh, spe especially today, I will uh, focus more on the gas detection. So uh, let's uh, give uh, some word about uh, uh, who is Ayanova. So uh, based on my accent, you could suppose that it's from France, but no, we are a Swedish company, uh, Ayanova, uh, and uh, we are providing and, uh, and proposing infrared detector for imagery and for very high sensitive uh, uh, detector and IM application and uh, gas detection requires very high sensitive detector. So this is uh, what I will uh, show you. And at the end, I will show you a, a quite exclusive uh, uh, information that uh, has been uh, allowed to be released uh, and uh, disclosed today. So uh, about, uh, yeah, uh, it's quite interesting, I would say. Uh, so this is the uh, picture, the, the kind of picture that we can uh, we can get out of a camera making use of an uh, infrared uh, detector from Ionova. This is a uh, Stockholm. So this is, uh, so there is still, I have still have a problem, Jose, with the mid IR, because your definition of mid IR is not exactly in phase. Uh, I complained last time, but it's uh, in phase with the uh, infrared the imagery uh, uh, network. So. In infrared imagery, there is the midwave, so from three to five uh, micron, and there is the long wave from eight to twelve or fifteen micron, depending on the, on the application. So uh, here, for the the mid the, for mid IR with the definition of a uh, uh, peak, I would say uh, we are going from three to fifteen micron uh, detector. So here, the, the the Stockholm view that you have here, it's in the midwave. Uh, in the midwave uh, range. So who we are? So we are in uh, in Stockholm, located north of uh, of Stockholm, and uh, we are currently we can claim currently that we are leading two types of uh, technology for infrared detector. That means the QIP, it's quite a well established uh, uh, detector for uh, for the long wave eight to twelve, and uh, also the T two SL. And then today we can claim that we are leading out of US. Uh, the T two SL detector, and I will show you the, today the advantage of this kind of a, of a new detector for uh, for the camera manufacturer and the system uh, manufacturer. There is also another point as a, uh, in this network we, we need uh, to show also what we can uh, what we can provide, and, uh, and we are looking for partnership. Uh, we are also proposing some uh, contract manufacturing. At Ayanova, so we have our own product that we can also uh, fabricate some uh, devices for uh, for uh, for partner or customer. And here, I, uh, today, I wanted to show some uh, realization. I cannot disclose what is this uh, this uh, this uh, this device. It's not a detector. This is the only thing I oops, sorry, I can say. But uh, we can uh, realize and fabricate uh, in a reproduce uh, uh, way and with a high yield of, of production. Very very dense. Uh, uh, and complicated uh, system based on three, five semiconductor devices. So, Ayanova, it's not a brand new startup as a uh, Miasense, for example, in this uh, in, the, in this network and uh, and, 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 and so on. Uh, Ayanova has been created exactly in 2007. It's a spin-off from uh, the Academia work work in uh, in Sweden. And since 2010, we are growing up. And we are now proposing more and more uh, a solution for the for a tactical application, that means for military application, but also our, I would say the most of our business currently is based on uh, for gas uh, det detector for gas application. This is what I will show. And we have a specificity also is that we have a patented solution for dual bound uh, detector. We can customize the dual bound detector depending on the application. And for this, we are working in close collaboration with uh, Spectrogram. And uh, here we have, I think that I saw that Stefan uh, from Spectrogram is there. And uh, I'm really proud that uh, we have this, uh, this network also in Sweden for infrared detector. It's a really uh, specific uh, thing. We are just few actors uh, on the planet to be able to do this kind of, uh, of a complicated detector. 
So just uh, quickly, our main business, this is the infrared detector to fabricate the FPA, the focal plane array. And uh, we have uh, one clean room, one, uh, one team to fabricate a, a very sensitive detector like QIP and T2SL. That just for the beauty of the microprocessing, I really like this, uh, these two SEM features. That's to show the, 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 how we manage and tailor the, the detector. That's, uh, that's very, uh, yeah, that's impressive. I'm impressed myself to have seen like this kind of a, of picture. So uh, let's back on the on the topic of the day. So we are proposing uh, different uh, uh, different detectors. So for the uh, to detect the gas, and uh, the, we I can say that we can detect uh, all the harmful gas uh, that uh, that we can detect in the mid IR spectrum on the epic with the epic definition. So in the midway from uh, the one to five micron. Uh, uh, range, we are making use of the T2SL, and by uh, designing specifically the, the detector, we can customize the detector to detect methane or, uh, or CO2 uh, uh, gas and other gas. So we have some uh, detector at the portfolio, that means that uh, this with a specific connection and so on, but we can also customize the, the, the detector if one of you uh, wish to detect uh, and to do and, and to picture uh, some leakage uh, in uh, with other guys than the uh, gas than this one for the long wave there are also harmful uh, harmful gases and uh, i will show uh, at, at the last slide i will show uh, i will show some uh, some realization in the long wave uh, so we are making use of the of the quip and uh, with the quip we are able to detect uh, sf6 uh, and ammonia or ethylene uh, gas and this is also quite a, a big runner in the, in the company. And again, we can also, in the long wave, customize the, the detector, the, the wavelengths to, to be detected in order to detect a specific gas. T2SL, so that's a, a brand new, I would say, a, a technology. Uh, not that brand new, because if you, if you pay attention to the history of Ayanola, we started, we proposed the first product in 2014. And uh, we started the research in the early uh, this century uh, on this technology. And today, there is really a game changer with the T2SL. As you can see, you can notice on this picture, this is the type of uh, uh, regular infrared detector. So we have this kind of detector also at, at home. But uh, this is the size that you find by all the uh, infrared uh, supplier, uh, uh, detector supplier. So uh, in, um, in Germany, in France, or uh, in Israel, or is there also in the uh, in, uh, in US. But with the T2SL, we can decrease by nearly a factor of two. You have all the, the, the features here. But uh, we can uh, decrease drastically, uh, significantly, the size of the detector. So the size, so the volume, the weight, and, and the power, the electrical power. And why this is possible? It's because with this technology, we can make the quantum detector, which is very sensitive, working at higher temperature. So this means that we can make use of very uh, small uh, cryo cooler. And this is really a game changer. I can tell you that there are plenty of development currently uh, of uh, camera de development that are based on this, on this uh, small detector. We can get access to, U to UAV, to drones, and, and things like that. And that, that's really that's really an exciting period uh, at Ayanova. And last but not least, what is very important is that the quality picture in this is exactly the same than in this big one. There is no compromise for the for the for the performance. This is really a new game changer. So this is in the midwave spectrum, so from three to five uh, to five micron. And for this, we can also uh, customize the the. Um, the, the, the filter and the detector for the, the gas detection. So, as I said, this is the, it, it's not to show all the portfolio, but we have some, uh, some uh, regular uh, product for the gas detection. And then we are also moving for the next generation, that means the HD format. So, for gas detection, I'm not sure, guys, that uh, it will be useful to have a, a, a HD format due to the sensitivity. When you decrease the, you go to the HD format, you decrease the pixel size. And I'm not sure that uh, it's uh, in the, the advantage of the sensitivity for gas detection, because that gas detection requires a very high sensitivity. But definitely, we are more than on our way for, the, for this HD. And this is the, the, the size, the, 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 the type of pixel that uh, and uh, realization that we can have for HD. Here, it's a 7.5 micron pitch. 
So as I said, we can customize also to the, the detector for the, for, the, for the gas detection. And uh, this is uh, what we did for, uh, uh, for um, a customer in Germany. And actually it's more than a customer, it's a, it's an, it's a consortium for Hanhofer and Constell R. And uh, in associate, we, we propose to, the, to Constell R a solution uh, to, uh, to remote sense the, the, the water consumption on Earth. This is a huge program that will lead, if, the, if it's a success at the end, uh, will lead to a constellation of CubeSat. So we propose a solution that uh, uh, satisfies all their specification or requests. And uh, we, we propose that in collaboration with the Spectrogram because we, are, we develop and, uh, and deliver a dual band long wave uh, infrared detector. And uh, it, if, uh, if I understood uh, my, my, my friend from Constell R, the, the launch of their payload uh, will be is expected in February next year and uh, to go to the ISS uh, uh, station, space station. And uh, this will be the ultimate demonstration before the, the production of a, of a constellation of, of CubeSat. So that's a, that's a brand new news that uh, I disclosed today for, for you guys at EPIC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for a great presentation. At the end of the day, I love when people share news here at this meeting. And always remember, whenever you have a new product, everyone, whenever you have a new product that you want to present, Epic has the Epic product releases, and there is where we want you to present your products. At this meeting, what we want is to share challenges. So, Eric, I'm going to ask you directly. So, today you are claiming that you are going smaller and smaller, and you will reduce in half the weight, in half the size. Uh, what are the main challenges to go even in a smaller aspect ratio and also are there is there a need a market need that you are seeing that demands to go even smaller in aspect ratio this, i would say that the smaller you go the less sensitive you are so uh, as the uh, uh, nit claim there are also alternative uh, detector for certain markets uh, that can uh, be uh, affordable for large large production and so on and uh, at the end it will be a, a trade-off between sensitivity and uh, and I would say pr uh, price and, and weight. But there are plenty of applications. When you set a detector in the ISS, uh, you need sensitivity and sensitivity as a price definitely. So uh, you need, uh, when you have a quantum, uh, 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 quantum detector, you need to cool it down. But the less you cool it uh, down, uh, definitely the smaller, the more compact is the, dete the, the detector. There is some uh, we have some uh, some development and we will release next year uh, so you saw that you remembered on the slide the, the small detector that is in the, in, in one hand so definitely it won't affect the size because we will need to, to keep a cryo cooler at, uh, uh, even at 150k of the, of the size of the detector we have however the power consumption will be reduced uh, drastically and uh, and also the what we the reliability of the detector will be increased uh, de definitely. So uh, I don't foresee currently a, a, a new. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're really my partner. You should work at Ion Nova, and uh, so de de definitely this one is already a huge, huge uh, gap and a huge achievement. So let's develop uh, let's develop the market with that, and maybe one day we will move uh, on the but. I don't foresee, except if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, I don't foresee uh, 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 possibility to have a smaller detector with the same sensitivity and resolution. Pavel Klusinski, for the market of industrial monitoring, Pavel, uh, you saw here, here is very clear the size. You saw the size of this detector. Uh, is that the, 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 the suitable desired aspect ratio that you would think is suitable for your demands? <laughs> Yes, of course, the size, the form factor is extremely important for us. And, uh, you know, so this, this is definitely something uh, which we always look at because of the fact that, uh, you know, the this analyzer normally sits in the, you know, very harsh uh, environment, which, uh, so the analyzer has some limitation also on the weight, for example, when it's mounted directly on the chimney, then the, the, the size uh, is, uh, you know, definitely something we have to look at. So it's... It's very interesting what I see here that the, you know this type of detectors and the, the, the cameras are you know getting much smaller than it used to be. I think uh, Johannes from Nanoplast, you have you have the question. I know spoilers. What is the question that you have? 
My question is, what kind of cooling technology are you using in your in your detectors? It's a, a cryo cooler. It's a Stirling cooler, so you can use a rotary cryo cooler or linear if you wish to have a more reliable uh, dete uh, uh, detector. You can use a, a Stirling linear split cooler. It's more expensive and the power consumption is higher, but definitely then you can reach uh, reliability for for a, a thousand a hundred of thousand of hours. I would say eventually it's eventually not. Um, possible to calculate the law to establish the real uh, MTBF of this kind of uh, cooler. For the rotary cooler, the, the, the one I, I, uh, I've shown uh, for the camera, it's in the range of 20,000 uh, hours, the, the, the MTBF of this detector. And now I saw the, the, the question from an uh, the, 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 the not the holy grail, the, the, the goal right now is to set the T2SL uh, uh, going, uh, keep it the same sensitivity up to 200K, that means minus 70, minus 80 uh, degrees C. And then when you reach this level, you can make use of TE cooler, uh, Peltier cooler. But definitely it's not in the right uh, way for the power consumption because TE cooler, uh, it's not that efficient and the power consumption is a, will be, and I think that uh, my, my, the colleague from, uh, uh, from Vigo will, uh, will confirm that the TE cooler, it's not uh, the most efficient way. However, in terms of size and, and, uh, and weight, definitely, and reliability also, that's really a, a solution. All the, way from, all the way from Tokyo, I have a, a person that I want you to meet, Eric, Yoshiaki Sang from Sumitomo Electric. You were quite impressed with the cooling mechanism of Fire Nova, right? Correct, Yoshiaki? Uh, yeah, uh, just, uh, just, uh, just uh, the smaller, uh, smallest cooler looks very nice. I'm uh, impressed. Uh, but I have uh, another question. Uh, so, so you have a uh, type super lattice uh, detector for short wave, mid wave, uh, and long wave, right? Yes, right now we have uh, we are more than mature and we have a solution and product in short uh, extended short wave and mid wave, mid wave especially. For the long wave, this is still under development. And uh, for the long wave, we get the quip uh, technology for uh, that is uh, covering uh, quite uh, a lot of uh, application. I would say ninety percent of the application. But we are working. We are developing the for the long wave currently. Oh, okay. Uh, great. Uh, it's great. And and uh, what the, uh, then? What's the difference uh, uh, between the type super lattice and the quip? Uh, you know, I'm, I, I cannot criticize too much the quip. I, I was one uh, part of the, the, the team pioneering quip in France, and now I moved to, to Switzerland. Now, definitely, quip it's an excellent solution for uh, uh, in the long way for very high sensitive detector and affordable detector. So definitely mm -hmm. for imagery, for military application, and also the okay. Now I can disclose in the ISS it will be a quip detector. So just to let you know that. Uh, yeah, it's uh, quite sensitive, but when you want to do spectroscopy, so with, with a large uh, spectrum, uh, spectral band, then quick definitely, uh, uh, they cannot do the job. So they have a limited the spectral band. But uh, when you really want to do uh, imagery, uh, th this, uh, this uh, spectral width, uh, width is far, far enough. I can tell you there is a lot of uh, uh, photons in the, in the long wave. And uh, we can also customize, and that's the beauty of a quick for gas detection, is that we can uh, customize, tailor the, the quip, the, the quip the spectral shape for a specific gas. And this is what we did notably for the SF6 detector. This is oh my God, you made me sweat with that question, Yoshiaki. My, my regards to the people from Linred, from Sofradin, I know you're watching. The next question for you, Eric, is coming from Fintech in Germany, the company in the passive alignment machinery. Thomas Müller, what's on your mind? Yes, hello, Eric. Thank you yeah, for this nice presentation. I have even two questions, Eric. The one is uh, uh, your flip chip bonding process. Uh, is it a room temperature high force process? Uh, what do you mean room temperature? The, the, all the, all the, the microprocessing is down at uh, uh, around room temperature, but uh, we need some time to heat a little bit, of course, for, uh, for certain reason. So uh, there are different techniques, and currently we use, and I can disclose that we use different techniques. We can have cold compression, mm -hmm. so that means you press, uh, or we can have also the, the reflow process. We've shown uh, uh, the expert can recognize that in our okay. paper, uh, no, no need to, to hide any things. 
and, and we have also thermal compression. So there are three ways of uh, hybridizing and the, the techniques that we choose, we, we manage the three and the, the technique we choose is uh, 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 relying on the, on the cost and the performance and, the, and also the, the size of the, of the detector. Okay, and the second question is about um, the common pitch you have wrote in your presentation, you are going down to uh, 7.5 micron pitch, right? Yeah, what correct. is the what is the bump size in that case? Uh, you can, uh, Jose, as you are managing my power presentation, can you come back on it? Uh, the, 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 the bump size, it's the height, it's in the range, it should, it should be a three of, in the range of three micron. Now up, Jose. Uh, no, down, 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 down. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Last page, I believe. Yeah, um, no, not exactly the last. The, 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 I, don't, the last. I don't have all your slides. I only took a selection of them for my summary. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I can share. I don't know if I have time enough, but the, the, the height is in the range of uh, three microns, something like that. The height and the three. diameter? Uh, I have marked that at 4.30, I had to give the floor to the star of the show today. So it's 4.35 and Eric took five minutes of a stardom, star. but you are the semi-star. <laughs> the star of the show today is a company that we met a couple of weeks ago. And the reason why they're the star of the show is because Miro Analytical is looking for strategic partnerships, but they had their first product in the market and it's a product that made us very excited. It's the first really multi-parameter gas sensing based on mid infrared technology that we could find with the right accuracy and precision. Oleg, you made us extremely excited for the last two weeks. We want everyone in Epic to know how they can help you. This is something really big in Europe. Thank you and congratulations. The floor and the attention of everyone on the mid -Air Alliance goes to Miro Analytical. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today because the subject is so important. And this is so much about what we care about here at Miro, the environmental monitoring, the air quality, and climate change, and all these problems actually are very, very <clears throat> important today. So let me introduce you to, uh, to our high-precision multi-compound gas analyzer. So we developed gas analyzer, which can measure up to 10 most relevant greenhouse gases and pollutants simultaneously, uh, directly with high precision and with high temporal resolution up to 10 Hertz. Uh, the, these gases are listed here on the left side, together with the precisions we guarantee. Uh, and these uh, uh, values are analyzed by the Allen Verley analysis. And here on the right side, you can see just two examples how we, how the precision depends on the time uh, integration time. So, what is behind this beautiful device is, of course, the middle infrared technology, and that's why I'm talking about here today with you. So, what do we need for that? We need the light source which is a QCL in our case. We need the optics, we need the middle infrared detectors, we need electronics, and of course, we need the software for the data analysis. Uh, the technique itself is straightforward. It is the direct laser absorption spectroscopy. By shining the laser uh, through the absorption absorbing medium, uh, we can observe how the intensity drops down. At, at particular wavelengths. And by measuring this, we can extract the information about the concentration of certain components. So let me just shortly mention that we uh, produce different kinds of, of these products, sometimes truncated version, depending on how many gases people need to measure. So it's pretty flexible technique, which allows us to tune the device for the particular needs. Now, I would like to switch to the examples of what our customers can do with this beautiful system. And one of them was actually conducted by the German scientist from Ulich, where they installed our system in this little rack, uh, which took space only of one commercial seat and was flying on a Zeppelin together with the passengers, with the tourists in Germany. And uh, the person who was operating the device was doing it through the internet, was observing uh, the online data sitting in his lab, and he observed at some point some peaks, 
some unexpected peaks for a few gases at the same time. And he asked the pilots actually to take pictures around and it turned out that they could spot a campfire with this particular fingerprint. So this gave them a very nice example of what scientists and whatever people can do with this device just by looking at so many gases at the same time and thinking of what chemistry is going on, what pollutants, what kind of leaks are happening around and so on. Another example is coming from here, from Zurich. The canton of Zurich together with us drove our system in an electric van. And the whole system was powered by a three kilowatt battery, which was sufficient for the whole day of measurements. And this is just a, a short part of this whole campaign, uh, pretty, pretty funny and cool, I find it. So while driving in a tunnel back and forth, they found out that driving in one direction, they see higher concentrations for many gases compared to the driving in the opposite direction. And the explanation actually was the following, is that the tunnel is simply tilted and driving in one direction, people give more gas. And that's why they produce more pollutants. And this example also shows that in these confined spaces like tunnels, it's actually easier to simulate what's going on. And based on the measurements people can provide together with the calculations, people can estimate the real exhaust level of the traffic under real conditions, which is also an issue today and should be addressed. Uh, talking of the air quality and environmental monitoring, of course, we need to see how well our system or this middle infrared technology measures the gases compared to the established techniques that are used so far in the real stations. And we've done this uh, parallel measurements over three weeks at some point, and we saw a very great agreements between uh, the standard techniques, including CLD, UV absorption, NDIR, and even cavity ring down. So there's very big potential in useful middle and thread, and this is no doubt, this is like that. Yeah. So actually, uh, my point was to not show you so many examples, and there are much more. I just wanted to, to summarize and say that middle infrared technology is, is a really great tool. We're so happy to use this. And of course, uh, we discussed this already earlier that this is quite pricey at the moment, right? So middle infrared technology is not for everyone, but I think our goal should be that we make it affordable for more people. And therefore, I'm interested here in more suppliers and partners to find the best solution to make it more affordable for the whole world. And by doing this, save the planet. Thank you very much. You know, there's no better way. What can I say after somebody says that they want to save the planet? Whatever I say now is obviously not important. What is important is that we are here to find your partners, all right? So I want to find your partners on the light source and on the detectors. One of the companies that made the most exciting on the light source lately, and of course we had the, the Mircens and Nanoplus and they are very well established, but there's a new one coming and coming strong. And the company is called Quantium. Quantum Technologies. Jan, how are you going to try to solve the challenge that everybody is saying that, uh, that we have to reduce the cost of the QCL? Yes, hi. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to um, say that we are actually not in the business of gas monitoring because our lasers are extremely widely tunable um, with very many addressable wavelengths in the meantime, but they're digitally tunable, so they're not continuously tunable. That's why DFB lasers are generally probably the better solution for, for gas monitoring. We are focused on everything else. So that's um, biomedical tissues, that's solids, and that's liquids. Um, but I can briefly say for our case, um, the, the way forward on uh, dropping the price is um, by creating or by, by loosening the alignment sensitivity of uh, the lasers. But we are basically making external cavity laser systems. So that's uh, different to the, the DFB uh, systems mostly used in uh, gas spectroscopy. Thank you very much, Jan. And we are very excited about what you're doing. We want to help you. So any company that can help on 
a company that wants to reduce the alignment challenges between the optics and the laser diode, here you have to contact Quantium Young. Great. Oleg, back to you. So we are talking about the challenges on the light source and the challenge on the detector. In your vision, do you expect to have a light source that sweeps the entire mid-infrared or do you expect to have a light source tuned to each one of the absorption bands that you want to monitor in the gas analysis? Look, it depends. I'm open for whatever what is possible, of course. Um, I mean, not exactly you're going to measure, you can go for DFBs. Yes, but if you if you want to measure more complicated substances like organic compounds, then probably wider range are welcome. Adrian from QCL Lasers Mirsense in Grenoble, I would like to ask you, what advice could you give? You, you, for a multi-parameter sensor, I'm going to put here the, the slide that was uh, shown from the band that we all loved. For a multi-parameter sensor that want to monitor all these gases, could you suggest to have each laser diode tuned to each absorption band or to sweep an entire band? I believe if at Mirsense, if we would supply lasers, we would supply uh, a laser that is specifically addressing um, one wavelength. So we would not sweep the entire the entire spectrum. However, uh, thanks for giving the, the opportunity. I would like to share a slide with you guys. Go ahead. Uh, that, that could, um, because let me just, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, share screen. Yes, put on the same window, share yeah. a screen, you know the drill. Oh, yes, okay, yeah, yeah. okay can, can you see my screen now? Crystal clear. Okay, good. So, yeah, um, it seems that um, um, customers are asking for low cost sensing solutions. Um, and one way to address this at a mere sense is not so much as in selling a lot of lasers at a very low cost, maybe like Nano Plus is, is doing a good job at doing. Um, we are actually, because we manufacture the chip, we integrate the chip in a very small um, photoacoustic module. So we also chose a technique that is not direct absorption spectroscopy like Miro, uh, but we chose a technique that can scale down with volume because we don't need optics, we just use microphones. And so I just want to share with the community today that you see this little fellow here uh, next to a one euro, um, one euro uh, coin. This is actually a module that we manufacture at Mearsense that has the QCL chip integrated. And this is meant for application with a lot of volume. So if one of you guys wants to detect gas molecules, we could maybe help you by supplying you not the laser, but directly the, the whole module, which is very small because we manufacture the chip and we're able to integrate it um, inside this very small. It's probably the smallest gas analyzer in the market with a QCL inside because we, we just integrate the chip, which is maybe five millimeter long. So, yeah, I'd like to share this. Pa Pavel from Aeroptic, if you're willing to test this laser in one of your systems, I pay for the shipping expenses more. I go to Grenoble, I pick it up, and I drive to Poland to test it there, Pavel. I bet you that. You know what, everyone? If the mid Alliance had a president, it doesn't have a president. We are all equal here. But if it had a president, that president would be Slava Artyushchenko, CEO of Art Photonics, the person who pushed the most for this to happen. Slava, what's on your mind? Uh, I would like just to show uh, my screen for a moment. Uh, is it visible now? Yes. Uh, okay, I appreciate it will be, it was really a, a lot of great uh, talks, but most of them were really uh, devoted to the uh, quality of atmosphere, gases, and so on. Uh, and all of us, of course, we must breathe, and we would like to have a clean air. But I think we also eat sometimes, we drink every day. So that's why uh, environment monitoring is needed not only for uh, uh, gas phase. And um, uh, with fiber optics, there is a chance to do something which is impossible with uh, open air 
devices because quantum cascade lasers, any kind of measures when you don't need, uh, let's when you have direct access, it's easy, I should say. But when you really must control, for example, something in soil, uh, and uh, for example, soil can be really uh, contaminated, you know, then uh, uh, here, for example, uh, only in Russia, there are something like uh, 6 million tons of petrochemical pollutions going in, in, in soil. So that's why monitoring, uh, you should really go with a stick of uh, fiber optic inside soil at some depths and control how this remediation um, improvement of the soil quality is running. So that's why I share with Jan Kishkat, you know, that um, it's good to really have quantum cascade lasers for narrow wavelengths. But um, uh, what we really already started, and you see a nice prototype we started with Nano Plus, where the laser was fiber optic coupled. But uh, it can be also other products of Nano Plus, MirSense, uh, who else? It can be not always quantum cascade laser with DFB. It can be fabri laser. It can be uh, infrared LED, which is already available because when we replace in infrared, for example, uh, spectrometer for infrared for four LED, we were able to calibrate this kind of fiber optic sensor for the precision of moisture detection for this 0.1% um, um, uh, accuracy. So my vision of the future, and I hope all of us uh, will share it, that in the future, we really need a lot of sensors and they should really sit in drinking water supply. We all would like to drink pure water without any toxic pollutants. We must control wastewater. We must control soil if we would like to eat uh, normal uh, vegetables or let's say to drink normal milk from the cow. So that's why idea will be like that. It will be low cost, very important, really low cost sensors where when it's fiber optics, it must go through the wall of pipe or reactor, or it sh should go to the soil. And they will be spread for thousands or million pieces, but they should really deliver like uh, their signal, their spectral data to maybe only for few valences, characteristic valences to the cloud. And cloud should work, let's say, to bring uh, information to your iPhone. That's uh, my feeling that it will be some kind of internet of things of chemical sensors used for environment monitoring. And all of us will be very busy to develop them and produce for the applications. And yes. that's why if we had a president, that would be you, Slava. Thank you very much. <laughs> but also as making oh. meaning infrared fibers, I want to address a point. I want to address a very important point. In Europe, we have the best super continuum lasers in the world. Companies like NKT, NKT Photonics and Lucos are making a big difference in this industry. Do we have anybody for Lucos in the room? Karin, Karin Beck, I would like you to tell my very good friend now from Miro, Oleg Asef, how he could actually use a laser to cover an entire van for environmental monitoring. How can supercontinued lasers being used in environmental monitoring, Karin? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, well, I'm very happy to discuss about the supercontinuum lasers. Uh, we've been talking a lot about single wavelength lasers, now line widths, and uh, with the super continuum, we have a tool which is very versatile. Uh, we're going to cover a very broad wavelength range in a continuous spectrum. So for the mid IR, we will be able to cover from 1000 nanometer up to 4.1 micron. Uh, with this kind of product, I'm going to share my screen so that eventually you could see what I'm talking about. Okay. If you want to know, you want to show your products, I can I can share my screen as well. I I had them in front of me. Almost. Okay, you have the data sheet of the product. Yeah, of Good. Okay, so you go on the super continuum. You are in the accessories. <laughs> Sorry. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mid IR electro mirror. So one, yes, this one, exactly. And you go down. You have the data sheet at the bottom. Uh, yep, green, a little bit higher. You get the green link. Okay. Yes, green I sheet. found it. You see, I can do anything. Yes. You see, Eric, how good I am? 
You have to hire me. Yes, go All ahead. All right. So we're going to focus on the spectrum at the bottom of this first page in order to show the extension. Um, what I found very interesting in uh, the last exchange uh, is that uh, we've been talking since the beginning about gases for environmental monitor monitoring. And the fact is that uh, in when it comes to environment, we don't only look at gases. When you use a super continuum in order to find the value of such product, you will be looking at many things. So sometimes it will be the conventional gas that you will find in the industry, but also you will be looking at some specific molecules uh, like hydrometeors, like uh, pollutions, like pollens that you can detect with such tool. So when it comes to the supercontinuum this way, you don't, you most of the time won't be using a filter. You would just send it in the atmosphere and get the retrodiffusion back to make the, the spectral analysis. So it could be spectral analysis, hyperspectral imaging, depending on what you want to see on this full range. Oleg, don't comment on this yet, because before you comment, I want to go to another company, Team Photonics. I think I have somebody from Team Photonics in the room, correct? Yes, I should have somebody from Team Photonics in the room. Uh, yes, she is here, Giovanni. Thank you very much for joining. Do you have something to add to this? Because afterwards, I want to go to Oleg and ask him, what do you feel about using a laser to cover an entire band. But Giovanni, tell us, what do you do with Team Photonics in the mid infrared for, especially OPOs, I heard? Yes, exactly. So uh, Team Photonics offer for the first time a mid infrared tunable OPO light source. And I'd like to share my screen so you can see what I'm talking about. Give me a minute. Okay. So do you all see my screen? Ah, okay. Crystal clear. Okay, good. So as I said, uh, Team Photonics offered for the first time a mid infrared OPO source, which is widely tunable from 7.5 to 13 micron, or from three to five micron. Uh, this source emits nanosecond pulses, and it has narrow, pretty narrow line with down to 100 megahertz and relatively high peak power up to 100 watts. And the source was developed in partnership with Onera and Thales Research and Technology in a project fund funded by DGA, which is a French governmental agency for, for defense in, in France. So the principle of this source is that it's a, a cavity with an nonlinear crystal that is pumped by a two micron microchip laser. Uh, the two micron pulse laser is also available on its own on demand. Uh, but here on the right, you can see a picture of the prototype of this OPO source. So you see here it's relatively compact, and then you have its controller on the right. And this prototype has been tested on the field for remote gas detection. So it was implemented in a LiDAR system to detect toxic, ga toxic gases. Uh, a cooperative target was used at 300 meter distance. And you can see here the principle of the source. So it's the, in the emitter here. The gas cloud is the, the toxic gases that we wanted to detect. And then the target reflects back the light to the receiver. And the conditions of those tests were pretty harsh. I mean, it was windy, rainy, cold for several days, uh, but we managed, we succeeded to, to detect the, the gases. So uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for what you're doing because it's absolutely spectacular. So Oleg, I cover both ways. You see, I, I told you about the individual and I cover both bands with different solutions. What do you think? Can we try? Can we test it? Can we make it happen? That, that, that's great. That's great to hear that there are sources. I mean, I heard of them, of course. Uh, you know, what I want to say is that we measure kind of trace causes with the sub PPB precision, right? And this is what people often need. This is our niche. And the key factor here is the stability. The laser stability is so important. So I never saw this super continuum in action on my own. But uh, my question is how stable it is. So the, this should be should be checked first, right? But again, as I mentioned, the applications might be different. If we need to measure even more than 10, but maybe with the compromised precision, then I think these sources can be used. Yes. Karin, can you comment on the stability with ultrafast photonic speed? I need to know which kind of stability you're thinking about. Over can you time. define it? 
because it depends always when we talk about stability, it depends on the laser repetition rate, on how you do the acquisition. Oleg so is a system parameters. integrator, Karin. Oleg is a system integrator. He yeah, wants so the device think, to work 24 seven for the next five years. No, this is no, this is lifetime you're talking about. Uh, it's different than if we talk about stability, is it stability as power? I don't know. And I think when we talk about stability, we need to define which kind of detection you're doing in order to define really what you what you are measuring and looking for in terms of stability. This is a very technical discussion yes, that we should is. have. I it is indeed, but I, I, I'm the CTO, so, and so you know I think I, I would love to discuss it with you face to face later on. Yeah, we sure. don't have to discuss it we'll now. do that. It's going to be very interesting, of course. Yes. Yes. And I also want to discuss to add into the discussion Giovanni as well. We can cover every wavelength band. And I would like to know how the result of the discussion goes. To close this fantastic meeting, we wanted to select a success story in Europe. And for that, we are going to go to Neuchatel. We're going to go to CSEM. And to close the meeting, I think Laurent Ballet is going to give us the way that we deserve to go, the floor. And the attention of everyone goes to CSEM. The floor is yours. Laurent, maybe you are muted. I cannot yes. hear you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so we'll tell a little bit about what we do at CSM in the meeting for red technology. So there are different type of projects. CSM is a, is a company that does research and development for industry. And um, I will specifically speak about one of the success story, as you said, um, it's uh, the Flare project. It's a European project. My slide on the Okay. Um, Flare project was a, a European project, and at the end, we did an airborne field test. So we put a detector inside this helicopter, and the helicopter was flying um, um, on board, and the boats were cruising the channel between Denmark and Sweden. And you can see here, one of the day, uh, we um, monitored, uh, like, um, I think it was more than 123 ships over three days, and we monitored the gas um, escaping the chimney of the, of the boat. Uh, here you can see one of the measurements. So we really targeted uh, methane for this experiment, and we could measure emission from uh, from ships. So you can see here on this graph, when the helicopter is doing five flybys uh, on the fumes of the ship, of the ship, then you can see some elevated concentration of methane. And to be sure that we measured correctly, we use our flare system, which is our developed system, and also reference based on um, quantum cascade laser. And you can see both of them really match perfectly in the measurement uh, concentration of methane. You can see here the picture of our system, which was on the passenger um, seat of the um, helicopter, and where the air intake uh, in front. Now, uh, you spoke about light sources. Um, we used for this project a uh, custom made um, um, supercontinuum from NKT Photonics. It's based on a Z band fiber, and um, we had uh, like it was centered at 3.3 micrometer. So that's why we retargeted methane. And it was really uh, small in size and low in power consumption. Um, then, to have a good interaction length with gas, we used a multipass gas cell, which was developed by Sensair. And it looks like that it's two um, set of mirrors, and the light is um, traveling um, several times back and forth. And in 30 centimeters of physical length, and we had 12 meters of optical pass length. And sensor designed um, enclosure around it because we were uh, working in different environments, like on the sea, we also did a test with a Zeppelin, also in cars. And they wanted to make sure that the um, distance here, I mean, the quality of the alignment didn't change. So they had this kind of thermos um, enclosure around um, the in a 3D printed structure around the multipass cell. Then on top of that, we built our spectrometer. You can see the um, uh, CAD design of the spectrometer we used, where the supercontinuum light coming here, um, being directed to the multipass cell, uh, doing the back and forth and coming up, being dispersed by the grating and coming to a detector. At first, we thought of it using a, a single pixel detector, like a mercury Cadman telluride. And you can see on, uh, on methane detection, the blue curve on the bottom, but then we decided to go for another type of detector, which is a camera from NIT Photonics. And I will tell you uh, soon why. And you can see both are really similar in detecting, uh, for this example, detecting methane. So as I just said, we use uh, this camera from NIT. And uh, it's really nice because it's uncooled. 
it's a two-dimensional array detector and uh, based on the Tachyon uh, camera from NIT. And it's really small. Um, it has a speed of up to 4,000 frames per second and it's really cost effective. And here you can see the responsivity of uh, the main material used, which has a maximum around 3.3 uh, micrometer, which is again is perfect for, for methane detection. Um, you know that this kind of camera of detectors have some uh, problems with um, sensitivity or, or stability, and we had to find some ways to get a really um, low um, detection limit, which was in our case like 500 ppbs for methane. And so we performed the well-known non-uniform gain compensations, the NUC. We also did some locking modulation at uh, 113 hertz and uh, acquired at 1,000 frames per second. And then we also um, add on this path here a cylindrical lens to spread the spectrum vertically on several rows of pixels. And you can see here what it um, did. It's um, when you have a narrow um, line and you uh, sum vertically, then you get this kind of spectrum, which is quite noisy. But when you spread a little bit more, then you have more data points to do the, um, the summation, and then you get really clean and nice spectra. And that's how we managed to go to a subatmospheric uh, background level of, uh, of methane. And the final prototype looked like that. It's a uh, 16 kilos, so it was fitting well, um, for example, in a drone or uh, in a helicopter. It's quite small, low power consumption, was uh, operated on batteries sometimes, and uh, we could uh, connect to it remotely through the 4G network. And there you can see all the partners in these really great projects that really helped from, for that. And for my last slide, I just want to speak about an kind of an extension of, uh, of FLARE project, the triage project, also H2020 project, with more or less the same um, partners and more or less the same idea. But in this case, we use another type of supercontinuum um, source, which is provided by Norblis in uh, Denmark. And you can see it's a source that will go from uh, two to uh, more than 10 micrometer in wavelengths. This graph here is from um, a previous work on a first prototype, but uh, it will be improved. Um, in order to um, really um, get a better detection, we will use uh, a longer multipass cell and use a Fourier transform spectrometer. And we use some um, balance detection, which are developed right now by, uh, by Vigo Systems. And, uh, and the goal here also to use um, uh, machine learning to um, detect the spectra and uh, detect the, um, the gas and concentration and also do some trending and maybe some alarms and also to use uh, big data techniques and good computing to share the data of several such devices um, and um, share them with the population. And I'm open to questions if you, if you wish. Thank you very much for that. We really love to see that cooperation between our members are happening. It is 506. And I would like to let everybody know that this project is not a close group of companies. They are looking forward to bring it forward. So what kind of companies do you want to interact with uh, after this meeting? What kind of companies do you need for the next stage after the project is finished, Laurent? Well, at CSM, we're open to, um, to help any companies. So um, we really um, are system integrators. We have uh, quite some experience with different um, techniques, um, also in the mid IR range. So I would be happy to collaborate with any one of you. And that's where we have a mid-infrared alliance. I would like to highlight that this meeting is just a continuation of previous events. For us, it's very important that you keep interacting with the EPIC and with the mid infrared Alliance. It was all about understanding the need of system integrators and show them that there are different solutions on the light sources. And we talk about the quantum cascade lasers. We talk about the supercontinuing generation. We compare the different technologies from nanoplast, from Kumirsense, from quantum. We talk about the detectors as well. We talk about the cooling and cool operation. I love the IR Nova presentation. I love to hear about NIT. I I love to hear how more and more the small aspect ratio is achieving. We heard from NASA what they are doing. They are looking for cooperations. It was truly spectacular. I loved it. Please stay because we can have a closing discussion. But now I have to say goodbye to our friends from YouTube. We built a shared marketplace to boost. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. If you are in our Zoom room, our informal private discussion is about to start. I call it virtual drinks with friends. And we all know follow-up is important. 
But for now, if you are watching on YouTube, that's where we leave you for today. Thanks to the Epic Production crew and all the sponsors for making today's event possible. More details about upcoming meetings are on our website. And if you want to get in touch with any of the participants, all you have to do is contact me directly and I will make sure you get introduced. It is all about connections. Thanks for being epic.